Just like when a real housewife finds out her Gucci bag is a fake, we're going to swear. Arisha. Brooke. I want you to imagine it's 8.30 a.m. on March 27th, 1995. You're in Milan, Italy, and you're standing on the steps of Via Palestro 20. It's an elegant Renaissance-style building where only the city's most elite businessmen can afford office space. The street is picture perfect. There's a canopy of lush maple and fir trees. Directly across the street is the city park, an oasis of green dotted by yellow forsythia. But even though the street is calm, your eyes are busy. You're constantly scanning left and right. And once in a while, you take a little notebook and pen out of your breast pocket and scribble something down. Please tell me I'm a detective. Well, kind of. Your name is Giuseppe Onorato. You're an ex-military man who's now a doorman, and you take your job very, very seriously. Two years ago, a car bomb just down the street killed five people. And you saw a strange looking camper parked right next to where the bomb went off, but you didn't report it. Oh. So ever since then, you've been writing down everything out of the ordinary, just in case. Like right now, you've just noticed a man across the street. He's in an expensive light brown overcoat and you've never seen him before. You're not used to seeing strangers at this hour. You reach for your notebook, but hesitate. The man looks rich. He's probably waiting for someone in the building. So you ignore him and continue scanning the street. And that's when you see it. See what? A green car parked across the street. It gives you instant goosebumps. You've never seen such a bad parking job before. It's definitely going into the notebook. Okay, if we're going off bad parking jobs, there aren't enough notebooks for LA. (laughs) Truly. So you're about to make a new entry when... Buongiorno. It's Maurizio Gucci. Your entire body relaxes. Maurizio likes to arrive at exactly the same time every morning, 8.35. This man is routine personified. Every day he dresses in head-to-toe Gucci. (laughs) Of course he does. And every day, Maurizio bounds up the steps to the front door with a boyish energy you wouldn't expect from a 46-year-old. Some of the other tenants gossip about him, about his contentious divorce and his nasty legal brawls with his famous family. But he's one of your favorites. Always friendly, always punctual. You could set your watch by him. So you push the notebook back into your pocket, Buongiorno, you call back. You reach for the front door as he takes the steps two at a time. And as you pull the door back, your eyes skip back to the street. The man in the light brown coat is gone. Maurizio is almost at the door. The sounds don't make sense at first. Your eyes are on Maurizio's coat. How is it flapping when there's no wind? But then Maurizio falls and you see the man in the light brown coat standing right behind him. His finger is on the trigger. His nails are perfectly manicured. His hair is thick and wavy and slicked back with gel. You notice every little detail as he turns the gun to you and fires. Oh my God. For what feels like an eternity, you lie on the ground. Maurizio, who is lying beside you, has stopped breathing. In the distance, you hear a car peeling out of a parking space and speeding off. You're bleeding out, but you can already hear sirens approaching in the distance. You go over every single detail you can remember. The car's exact shade of green, the cut of the man's coat, his perfect fingernails. You already know this murder will shake Milan to its core. You're not gonna let your city down again. You're going to report every last detail. You're gonna help them identify Maurizio Gucci's killer. If you can help it, the question won't be who, it'll be why.
From Wondery, I'm Brooke Sifrin. And I'm Arisha Skidmore-Williams. And this is Even the Rich, where we bring you absolutely true and absolutely shocking stories about the most famous families and biggest celebrities the world has ever seen. It's a show about power, how you get it, how you keep it, and what happens when you lose it all. It's also about how the rich are just like us, because even the rich fall in love and break up and struggle. They struggle to remember the Met Gala theme every year, that's for sure. Yeah, when in doubt, go with a couch print. (laughs) In this three-part series, we're telling you the story of Maurizio Gucci, a lonely and timid young boy who fought his way to the head of the Gucci family table. Along the way, he turned an epic family empire into an epic family feud, pitting cousin against cousin, brother against brother, and husband against wife. And just when it seemed like Maurizio might emerge from the fight unscathed, he was killed in cold blood. At the start of the investigation, the list of suspects was endless. Who arranged the hit? Was it his jilted ex-wife who still refused to acknowledge their divorce? Was it one of the many Gucci cousins who hated him? Or was it the mafia, who he allegedly owed millions to? As the lead detective on the case said, we're going to have to take Maurizio Gucci's life in our hands and open it like a book. And like any good book, we've got to start on the first page. This is episode one, Humble Beginnings. It's 1899. We're in London's Savoy Hotel, the first luxury hotel in the city. It's where the rich and famous go to see and be seen. And Maurizio's grandfather, Guccio Gucci, who might have the laziest name of all time, (laughs) is right in the thick of it all. Not because he's rich and famous, but because he isn't. His family sells belts and other small leather goods. And to be honest, they're not very good at it. They're so not good at it that they've just declared bankruptcy, which is how Guccio finds himself carrying luggage up and down long hallways for Europe's A-listers, Winston Churchill, Claude Monet, Sarah Bernhardt. It's backbreaking work, but a part of him loves it because Guccio loves people watching, especially rich people people watching. Mm, Do I have the podcast for him? Yeah, Business Wars, it's a good one. (laughs) Guccio loves hearing what rich people talk about, what impresses them, and what they spend their money on. He notices their jewelry, their clothing, and the one item they all really splurge on, their luggage. The steamer tanks and suitcases are massive, and they're made of such soft and buttery leather, they're hard to get a grip on. But as Guccio lugs them to the guests' rooms every afternoon and lugs them back out again every morning, an idea begins to form. If Guccio knows one thing, it's leather. He can name, with relative certainty, exactly which Italian workshops the leather on these suitcases came from. Maybe his family's been doing it all wrong. Maybe they need to sell items bigger than belts and sell them to people with much bigger bank accounts. A few years later, Guccio moves back to Florence and follows his hunch. He spends all his savings opening a luggage shop. And it turns out his hunch was right. His family business is profitable enough to support his own growing family, which now includes a wife, three sons, and a daughter. From the start, he has big plans for the business. He's not gonna be like his parents who ran their business so poorly it forced him to leave home. He wants his business to be so successful that it keeps his family together. He's determined to make sure that for the next generation of Gucci's, the words family and business are interchangeable. Okay, but does that ever work? I mean, how many seasons have we done now? 21, 22? (laughs) Okay, well, in this case, it works, at least at first. His first three kids all find their niche in the growing Gucci empire. His daughter, Grimelda, who loves to gossip, works behind the counter and knows how to chat up customers. His son, Aldo, who has a natural flair for business, begins opening other Gucci stores across Italy. His son, Vasco, who's not quite as bright as Aldo, starts to oversee production. But then there's the youngest son, Rodolfo. And here's where our story really starts. 
because Rodolfo will one day have a little son named Maurizio. And you can't understand who Maurizio is or why he was murdered if you don't understand Rodolfo. I'm sorry, I know I'm throwing a lot of names that end in O your way. No worries, Brooko. I'm <laughs> keeping up. We've got Guccio, who's the grandfather slash founder, Rodolfo, his son, and then Maurizio, the grandson, who is not yet alive. Great job. So at this point, it's a given that everyone's going to go into the family business. Rodolfo's older brothers are already having kids of their own. And every time a new grandson is born, Guccio says the same thing. Let him smell a piece of leather, for it is the smell of his future. But Rodolfo doesn't love the smell of leather. He inherited his father's love of style and his instinct for elegance. But those same qualities are taking him in a very different direction. When he's a teenager, he finally musters the courage to tell his dad, I wasn't born to be a shopkeeper. I was born to be in films. Oh my God, just like when we sat our parents down and said we weren't meant to be valets. <laughs> yeah, sadly, his dad isn't as understanding as our parents. <laughs> Guccio screams at Rodolfo. That's insane. The film business is full of lunatics. You'll come crawling back. And when screaming doesn't work, Guccio just pretends his son never said anything at all and he puts him to work as a delivery boy. But that plan quickly backfires. Okay, to be fair though, you're not really an actor until you've worked a terrible side job or four. I hate how true that is. But here's the thing. Rodolfo is kind of born to be in films. He moves with an uncommon grace and he has a sensitive, expressive face. One day when he's 17, he's delivering a package to a hotel lobby when a film director spots him and begs him to take a screen test. He immediately puts Rodolfo in his next film, Rote, which I'd never heard of before, but is apparently a masterpiece of silent cinema. Rodolfo becomes Italy's answer to Charlie Chaplin. Wow, so some people don't have to park cars while they chase their dreams. <laughs> Making luggage might be his father's dream, but it's not his. Film is giving him everything he's ever wanted. He's making good money. He's creatively fulfilled. And one day on set, he meets a free-spirited, high-energy blonde named Alessandra. The two of them instantly fall in love. They get married in 1944 in Venice. Rodolfo somehow manages to get the entire wedding weekend filmed from start to finish. The young couple has cameras following them as they ride a gondola, say yes at the altar, clink glasses at the reception dinner. Hmm, sounds like we have the reality star origin story. Yeah, going out with the Gucci's. <laughs> but this is Rodolfo's last hurrah because lately he's been getting less and less screen time. Silent films have given way to talkies and Italian cinema is changing. Now it's realistic, serious, and gritty. There's no room for Rodolfo's more comedic and expressive acting. And in 1948, Rodolfo and Alessandra have a son, Maurizio. So now, Rodolfo has another mouth to feed. With his acting career drying up, he knows it's time to do exactly what his father once warned him he'd have to do. Come crawling back to the family business. Oof. Yeah, it's devastating. But if there's one silver lining, it's that the family business is doing better than ever. Over the past decade, Guccio and his other kids have turned Gucci into the ultimate status symbol. And now they're not just selling luggage. They're selling shoes and scarves and trendy little tote bags. Elizabeth Taylor is a customer. So is Grace Kelly, Sophia Loren, even Princess Elizabeth, the future Queen of England. So Rodolfo tells himself it's all right. He'll find his place in the family business. And yes, he's lost one of his life's two great loves, but at least he still has the other, Alessandra. It's August, 1954. We're in a small hospital room and trigger warning, this story is about to get as bleak as one of the gritty Italian films Rodolfo never starred in. Rodolfo and Maurizio, who's only five years old, have just stepped inside. They've come here every day for the past six months. So Maurizio knows the drill. His father closes the door behind them, and then they approach the bed in the room's center. But lately, Maurizio has been hanging back and taking his steps toward the bed a little more slowly. Not long after Rodolfo re-entered the family business, Alessandra was diagnosed with cancer. 
And for the past six months, the cancer's been spreading. Every day, she looks a little less like herself, which is why Maurizio doesn't want to come closer. It wasn't long ago that she was beautiful and young and vivacious. And now, her own son barely recognizes her. She watches his eyes skip over her, never landing on her. And finally, she says, Maurizio, why don't you step outside for a moment? Mama and Papa need to talk. She sees the relief wash across Maurizio's face as he nods and slips out of the room. Now she glances toward her husband. She tells him, the doctors don't think I have much time left, so I need you to promise me something. Rodolfo takes her hand and says, anything, of course. Alessandra takes a moment to collect herself. She's so angry with life, it's hard to get the words out. I need you to promise me that Maurizio will never call anyone else mama. I am his mama. Only me. Ooh. Rodolfo barely needs to think about it. As far as he's concerned, he'll never be able to love again. So he gives her his word. He'll never remarry and he'll never let Maurizio call anyone else mama. I'm not a licensed therapist, but I don't think this is going to end well. No, it is not. Rodolfo never quite gets the hang of being a single father. He's strict and aloof and paranoid. He buys an apartment directly across from the police station because he's worried Maurizio might get kidnapped and he'll lose him too. He orders his chauffeur to drive behind Maurizio whenever he goes for a bicycle ride. He gives his son such a small allowance, Maurizio has to constantly ask the chauffeur for pocket change. And when Rodolfo hires a governess for his son, he warns her not to get too close. They didn't hire her to be a second mama. But it turns out Rodolfo doesn't need to worry about his son calling other women mama because one day Maurizio stops using the word entirely, even when they're talking about Alessandra. He begins to refer to her as quella persona or that person. Okay, still not a therapist, but that can't be good. Yeah, it's like Maurizio wants to repress the very existence of his mother but Rodolfo refuses to let that happen. And he knows exactly what he needs to do to keep the memory of Alessandra alive. It's 1958, and a couple dozen nine and 10-year-old boys are whispering and throwing popcorn at each other. Maurizio's father rented out an entire movie theater and invited all of Maurizio's classmates for a special screening. Everyone's shifting in their seats with nervous energy. What are they gonna see? Maybe a new release, like Hercules. The room goes dark. The curtains part. All eyes lock onto the screen. The film's title appears, Il Cinema Nella Mia Vita, or Film of My Life. And then, who appears on screen but Alessandra, young and luminous. So Rodolfo is screening one of his wife's old films? No, he's screening a new film, something of his own creation. He's taken clips from her silent films and footage from their wedding and a handful of home movies, and he spliced them all together into a feature-length production. The two loves of his life are back together again, film and Alessandra. Okay, it's kind of sweet. I mean, he wants his son to remember his mom, right? Yeah, but it completely misses the mark because Maurizio's taken by surprise and he's shattered. After the film ends, he goes straight home, flings himself on the living room couch, and cries the rest of the day. And while he's crying, he only says one word over and over again. Mama. His dad doesn't even comfort him. In fact, Rodolfo will spend the rest of his days tinkering with his film, adding scenes, moving scenes. Like if he just finds the exact right combination, it'll bring Alessandra back to life. So Rodolfo is like Dr. Frankenstein, but with film clips instead of body parts. <laughs> exactly. And as Maurizio becomes a teen, his home life doesn't get any better. When Rodolfo's not psychologically scarring his son, he's constantly fretting about him. He gives him a strict curfew so he doesn't fall in with the wrong crowd. He barely gives him an allowance so he'll learn the value of money. And he warns Maurizio that when he starts dating, he has to be very, very careful 
because with his last name, he claims all sorts of women with questionable pedigree will want to get their claws into him. (sighs) Eye roll. By 1970, Maurizio is 22 years old, all grown up, but still lacking self-assurance. He's gentle and timid and fades into the background at Gucci family get-togethers. He's not loud and bossy like his Uncle Aldo's sons, who've been groomed to be the heir apparents. But Maurizio is about to meet someone who's going to change all of that. Someone who's going to give him the confidence he needs to play the Gucci Game of Thrones. Oh, great. So our last episode is going to suck? No, of course not. But we do have a cameo from Ed Sheeran. (laughs) Anyway, this confidence boost, much to his father's chagrin, is going to come from a woman. A woman of questionable pedigree. The holiday season is all about being comfy. Is that your big declaration for today? I mean, tell me I'm wrong. (laughs) No, you're definitely not wrong. I cannot (laughs) argue with that. Yeah, and that's what's so great about Rafi's shoes. They're deliciously comfy the moment you put them on. Oh my God, they are. And they've got this unique seamless design that is unlike anything I've ever put on my feet. And I love that Rafi's are sustainably made with recycled materials like plastic water bottles, and they're fully machine washable too. Yeah, nothing says fall like soft, plush merino wool, right? Well, for the third year in a row, Rothy's is launching an exclusive autumn collection featuring washable merino wool styles. They're incredibly comfortable, cozy, and 100% machine washable. Plus, they come in a variety of colors, patterns, and styles. (laughs) So I just got back from Vegas. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's been to Vegas knows there's a lot of walking. And I wore my (laughs) Rothy slip-on sneakers. Hmm. And I will say by the end of the day, I was very tired but that had nothing to do with the Rothy's. And the best part is I washed them today and they look brand new. I just, I love Rothy's. Okay, nice. So right now Rothy's is doing something special. They gave us the chance to share this super rare opportunity with our listeners for a limited time. Yeah, so right now you can get $20 off your first purchase at rothys.com slash rich. That's R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash rich. Head to rothys.com slash rich to find your new favorites today. Pura Vida's biggest sale of the year is just around the corner. Ooh, I love Pura Vida. (laughs) Tell us more, Brooke. Okay, well, as you know, Arisha, Pura Vida is one of the coolest apparel and accessory brands out there. And now is the perfect time to check them out because their Black Friday slash Cyber Monday sale is coming up and you'll be able to get up to 50% off plus free shipping. Hot diggity dog. That's amazing. (laughs) Yeah, we're obviously big fans of Pura Vida's fair trade apparel and artisan made accessories because they're comfortable, casual, eco-friendly and just really cool. They've got buttery (laughs) soft cotton tees and hoodies with custom art graphics and super affordable jewelry with bracelets starting at six dollars and rings at twelve dollars. Obviously, I've talked about the T-shirts before, um, but they're still going strong and (laughs) I still love them. I'm honestly constantly wearing these T-shirts. They have cropped ones, which I love, and they have regular Mm -hmm. tees, which I then crop myself because I love a good crop tee. (laughs) You're a classic Um, cropper. I am. And I love their ring stacks. They have really, really cute stuff. And Pura Vida's biggest sale of the year starts on Black Friday. So to get up to 50% off plus free shipping, just text RICH to 388. 8817 and they'll notify you when the sale is live. That's rich to 38817 to get up to 50% off at Pura Vida. Terms apply. Available at puravidabracelets.com slash terms. And one more time, text rich to 38817. It's 1945 in Medina, Italy. An outdoor cafe is bustling, and Silvana Barbieri is hustling from table to table, taking orders and dropping off plates of homemade pasta. She puts on a smile, but inside she absolutely hates this job. Even though she's only 17, she can already see the rest of her life flashing before her eyes. She doesn't have much of an education, she doesn't have any money, This is her family's place, and Silvana's been waitressing here for years. She's probably going to be stuck in this small provincial town forever. And let me tell you, she definitely has dreams of a different life. Because the cafe is right off the main road, it's a hot spot for wealthy travelers. 
They pull up in their Alfa Romeos and Maseratis and eat al fresco in all the latest fashions like Bulgari and Ferragamo. And Gucci, of course. Certainly Gucci. And Silvana desperately wants what they have. It's not about the money, not really. It's about all the possibilities that money can buy. She wants to move to a big city and see the world. She wants to eat at restaurants that aren't her own family's. And she wants to know what it feels like to have other people wait on her. Silvana sets down plates of pasta at table number four and takes out her pad as she walks over to table number 10. A dead ringer for Clark Gable looks up from his menu and smiles at her. Buena sera, he says. Silvana blushes and looks down at her pad. <clears throat> Do you know what you'd like? He closes his menu and looks her right in the eye. I'll have linguine with clams and maybe you for dessert. Hmm, so creepy men is an international concept. Yeah, well, he actually didn't say that. I mean, maybe he did, <laughs> we don't really know, but he does ask her out. His name is Fernando Reggiani, and he owns a profitable trucking company. And in case you needed a side order of cringe along with your main course, Fernando is married. Of course he is. <laughs> so I assume Silvana just dumps the plate of spaghetti on his head. Sadly, no. But she doesn't go out with him. At least not the first time he asks. But over the course of the next year, he becomes a regular. Silvana's caught his eye. Every time he makes the trip from Milan to Rome or Rome to Milan, he stops by the restaurant. And every time he asks her out, Silvana finds herself blushing a little more. Her life still feels like a dead end, and he still looks like Clark Gable. So eventually, she says yes. <laughs> Silvana starts convincing herself that with Fernando by her side, she might get a shot at a new life. Maybe he'll whisk her away from her hometown and move her into his mansion. To Silvana, it doesn't seem so crazy. Fernando and his wife have never been happy, and they don't have any children. It seems even less crazy when Silvana finds out she's pregnant. Wow, I bet he's thrilled. Yeah, he's as excited as every other married man who's just learned their mistress is having a baby. <laughs> I'm imagining him like, I hope you know this doesn't have to change anything. Which isn't the reaction Silvana wanted. She's heartbroken. She's still stuck in her small town. And now she's in a small town while she's pregnant and alone. Everyone is super non-judgmental and helpful though. They even knit her this big, beautiful scarlet A and pin it on her dress. <laughs> and the hits keep coming. In 1948, she gives birth and Fernando refuses to give the baby girl Patrizia his last name. So then she would be Patrizia Snow. <laughs> exactly. Patrizia has no rights to any of Fernando's fortune, which is substantial. But Silvana isn't throwing in the towel. She's gonna fight for what she wants and for what her daughter deserves. She follows Fernando to Milan and gets a crappy apartment in the industrial part of town. And Silvana remains his mistress for 12 more years. Mm, that must be some phenomenal sex. Seriously. And in 1956, Fernando's wife passes away, which means, good Italian Catholic that he is, Fernando no longer has to divorce his wife to remarry. Hmm, the makings of an epic romance. God, it's inspiring. And after an appropriate grieving period, Fernando and Silvana tie the knot, and Silvana finally becomes Mrs. Reggiani. Silvana and Patrizia move out of their cramped apartment and into Fernando's luxe villa in one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Milan. Silvana now has everything she ever wanted, a big city life, and a new last name. And her daughter is finally living under the same roof as her dad. But Silvana and Patrizia are about to learn that among the wealthy, there's rich and then there's rich. And just because you have money doesn't mean you have respect. Picture this. It's the morning of 14-year-old Patrizia's first day of school. Now that she lives in a fancy villa, her parents are sending her to a fancy private school to match. It's called Collegio de la Fanchule, and it's where all the wealthiest, most established families send their daughters. And now these mythical girls who she's only ever seen from a distance are gonna be her friends. She feels like she stumbled into a fairy tale. And on Wednesdays, they wear pink. Exactly. 
So we don't have details about her first day of school, but I imagine she tries on outfit after outfit in her bedroom mirror. She's always loved bright colors and lush fabrics and gold jewelry, but Fernando is now happy to indulge her. I imagine her clipping on these heavy gold earrings and topping off her look with her newest jacket, a white mink coat, which of course, you know, I hate, but unlike me, Patrizia loves it. It's luxurious and a little over the top. She gives her mirror image a nod of approval as she heads out the door. She holds her head high as she makes her big debut down her school's central hall. She knows she looks good. And then a classmate standing in a group of girls calls out, nice fur, is it real? Patrizia smiles on reflex and offers up a tentative, yes. The classmate rolls her eyes and her friends snicker on cue. Really? Then I guess it's just you that makes it look cheap. Ooh. Patrizia's face goes white. She scans the crowd. All the other girls are wearing conservative skirt suits. None of them are wearing jewelry. She completely missed the mark. The other girls continue laughing as they walk past her. One of them spins around and calls out, our parents told us all about you and your mother. Don't expect a welcome wagon. Yeah, I don't think she's expecting a welcome wagon after this, unless wagons do hit and runs. (laughs) Seriously. The moment she comes home after school, Patrizia throws her fur coat on the floor and flings herself onto her bed where she sobs into her cheetah print pillow. Patrizia doesn't look up as the mattress shifts and her mom sits down beside her. But between sobs, she tells her mom everything, how excited she was when the day started and how awful the other girls were. Mm, One of those times when it's really good to have a mom around. Yeah, but Silvana's not the kind of mom who's going to stroke your hair or hold you. She lets her daughter finish talking and they sit for a long time in silence. Finally, Silvana says... You don't accomplish anything by crying. There's acid in her voice. Life is a battle and you must fight. Are you a crier or a fighter? Mm, Can you be a crying fighter? Yes, just like Jake Paul. Silvana goes on to give Patrizia the same speech she's given her a dozen times since they moved in with Fernando. I've gotten us this far. Now it's up to you to take it to the next level. You need to do whatever it takes to befriend these girls and meet their brothers. I had to work hard to marry rich, but you, it's all basically being handed to you. And here you are crying like a baby. Okay, so not a great motivational speech. No, and Patrizia feels like shit. It's like she's not good enough at school and she's not good enough at home. But she nods along. Lesson learned, she'll hide what she's feeling. She wipes off her tears and says, Yes, Mama, I'll try harder. You won't see me crying again. It's November 23rd, 1970. Patrizia has been living on the right side of the tracks for seven years now. She never became prom queen, or whatever the Italian equivalent of that is, but most of her classmates eventually got used to her. She's fun, confident, and a little bit wild. Maybe you wouldn't invite her to the country club, but you definitely invite her out for a night of clubbing. Tonight though, the universe got its signals crossed. Patrizia is at her neighbor Vittoria's debutante party, stifling a yawn. Her mother basically pushed her out the front door saying, think of all the eligible young men you'll meet. You have to go. Patrizia's eyes scan the room for a clock. She'll stay 20 more minutes tops. Her eyes move over the plush white rugs and the endless leather couch. Most of the other guests blend right in. They're in neutral shades of silk and cashmere. Patrizia, on the other hand, still wears outfits that demand attention. Tonight, that means a tight red dress and sky high heels. She's lined her eyes with black coal and coated her lashes in like a half a tube of mascara. And a sizable percentage of men at the party can't take their eyes off of her. One pair of eyes in particular have been on her since the moment she walked through the door. Patrizia grabs her neighbor, Vittoria. Psst, who is that man over there? Vittoria follows her gaze. You don't know? 
that's Maurizio Gucci. Patrizia laughs. A Gucci? Oh my God, my mother would love that. She looks at him more closely. He's tall and gangly, and despite everything his last name's known for, his suit is comically ill-fitting. His overgrown bangs keep falling into his eyes, and every time they do, he swats them away like they're spider webs he just walked through. She turns back to Vittoria. Pity for him, I only date grown men. Is he still looking at me? Vittoria raises her eyebrows. He is, and he's now walking over. Maurizio sidles up next to Patrizia, carrying two glasses of punch. He's already blushing as he says, Excuse me, but has anyone ever told you you look exactly like Elizabeth Taylor? Patrizia takes one of the glasses. Many, many times, she answers. But I can assure you, I am much, much better. Wow, this girl needs to teach a master class. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Maurizio is like, who is this woman? But he sees her eyes land on the wall clock and he knows he's already out of time. Maybe, maybe I can get to know you better over dinner sometime? Patrizia hesitates. Half the party is watching them and reports of this encounter will inevitably get back to her mom. She shrugs. Sure, all right. Vittoria knows where to find me. And with that, she heads toward the door. Okay, so is Patrizia just trying to play hard to get here or what? No, she actually has zero interest in Maurizio. She can size people up pretty quickly and Maurizio is too meek and mild for her. She doesn't just want a rich man. She wants someone who's her equal. But she also knows she can't turn him down. Her mother would kill her. So she lets him take her on a couple dates. He's still awkward as hell. He barely touches his dinner, which Patrizia takes to mean he's too nervous to eat. But while her school friends never really let her forget where she came from, she never gets the sense that Maurizio looks down at her. Through his eyes, she's tough and funny and confident, all the things he wants to be. He seems to worship her. She never would have expected that from someone with his pedigree. And while part of her hates how happy she's making her mom by dating a Gucci, she has to admit, Maurizio's making her happy too. But then Patrizia learns a little detail that makes her doubt everything. Remember how I mentioned that Maurizio's barely been touching his food? Yeah, truly the most unrelatable quality. (laughs) Yeah, well, Patrizia eventually learns the real reason. It's because Maurizio's also having dinner with his father every night and then having a second secret dinner with Patrizia because he's too scared to tell his dad he's dating anyone. Oh boy. Yeah, which means one of two things and neither of them is good. Either Maurizio looks down on her after all and isn't as serious as he pretends to be or he's serious, but he's even more of a coward than she feared and Patrizia has been wasting her time with him. Whatever Maurizio does next will decide the fate of their relationship. And what he does next, well, it's going to surprise everyone. Okay, I want you to picture this. We're at one of those nightly Maurizio Rodolfo father-son dinners. Usually it's full of long, awkward silences. But tonight, they're actually talking. Or, more accurately, they're screaming. Rodolfo's veins are bulging from his neck, and he's shouting, Her mother was a waitress. A waitress and a mistress. You can't possibly be serious. This is exactly the kind of woman I've been warning you about. So Daddy Dearest found out about Patrizia. (laughs) Yeah, but here's where the story takes a twist. Maurizio, for the first time in his life, is shouting back. I don't care who her mother is. I love her and nothing you can say will change that. Maurizio is acting like a completely different person. Rodolfo doesn't even know how to respond. So he decides go big or go broke. He tells Maurizio that if he doesn't stop seeing Patrizia, he'll cut him off. He'll write him out of the will. Is this girl, this Patrizia, really worth millions? I mean, she's got cheetah print pillows, so I'd say, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So Maurizio shouts back, she is. 
and then he packs a bag and leaves his father's house for good. Damn, so some of Patrizia's confidence rubbed off on him. Yeah, and Maurizio had no idea he had it in him. But that's the effect Patrizia has on him. She makes him feel like he can be more than just his father's puppet. He can be his own man. That just has one dinner a night. (laughs) Right. Later that day, he shows up on Patrizia's doorstep and tells her everything. He's homeless and penniless, and he has no idea how Patrizia will react. Will she still want to be with him? What if his father's right and she only wanted to be with him for his money? But Patrizia just throws her arms around him. The way she sees it, he's finally proven that he really, truly loves her. And he won't be homeless. Patrizia is sure her dad will let Maurizio stay with them. Rodolfo might not want him as his family anymore, but she very much wants him to be a part of hers. On October 28th, 1972, the two lovebirds make it official. Maurizio waits for Patrizia at the altar in a well-fitted suit for a change. (laughs) From the pews, 500 guests watch the ceremony. But as Patrizia approaches in a white column dress with a floor-length veil, she can see the disappointment in Maurizio's eyes. Yeah, he wanted another animal carcass outfit. (laughs) No, he actually wanted at least one of these guests to be a Gucci. And none of them are. Mm. Until this moment, Maurizio hadn't realized his father would take their feud this far. But he must have given everyone in his family an ultimatum. Rodolfo or Maurizio. Clearly, they all chose Rodolfo. Patrizia can read every last bit of hurt on her groom's face. So, as the priest leads them through the ceremony and presents them to the world as Mr. and Mrs. Gucci, Patrizia makes a pact with herself. She's gonna fight for her husband. She's gonna make sure they become Gucci's in more than name only. In fact, by the time she's done, they'll be the most Gucci of all the Gucci's. Now, she just needs to figure out how. One morning, over coffee and a warm Cornetto, Patrizia discovers her opening move. Right there in the New York Times is an interview with Maurizio's uncle Aldo. Over the past 10 years, both Aldo's father, Guccio, and his brother Vasco have passed away. The company now belongs 50-50 to the two remaining brothers, Aldo and Rodolfo. Hold up. I know there was a sister in there somewhere. Yeah, Grimelda. But sisters don't count. She was written out of the will the moment they noticed she had a vagina. (sighs) So now, Aldo and Rodolfo control Gucci together. But it's only an even split on paper. Aldo's really the one in charge. Rodolfo spent most of his life making new director's cuts of his home movie. So when it comes to who's next in line for the throne, all bets are on one of Aldo's three sons. None of them are, shall we say, overachievers, but all the real power flows through Aldo. Okay, so then Maurizio ranks somewhere close to Prince Harry's son, Archie. Well, yeah, that's what you'd think. But in this New York Times interview, Aldo hints that he's been disappointed by his three sons. When it comes to his successor, he's ready to start looking elsewhere. Patrizia doesn't waste a second. She rings Uncle Aldo directly and cuts right to the chase. Maurizio still wants to go into the family business. It's just his father who won't let him. But Aldo could bring him back into the fold. Think of how valuable Maurizio could be. Someone who's a purebred Gucci and ambitious and dependable. She doesn't even need to say, like your sons aren't. Aldo is smart enough to connect the dots. He admits he has a job opening in New York, a job where someone like Maurizio could prove himself. But he'll have to think about it. A few days later, Rodolfo invites Maurizio to his office to talk. At this point, they haven't talked in two years. So Maurizio's nervous. But when he arrives... Rodolfo greets him warmly. He kisses his son's cheeks and even asks how Patrizia is doing. He's acting like their big rift never happened. Maurizio's so relieved, he just plays along. And then it gets weirder. 
Rodolfo tells Maurizio that his uncle Aldo has a job for him. Okay, some of these words are starting to sound very familiar. (laughs) Yeah, and he thinks Maurizio should take it. It's time for him to truly be a Gucci again. So then Patrizia planted the seed and Aldo watered it. After their call, Aldo thought long and hard about what Patrizia said. He used to look right past Maurizio because he was such a timid little boy. But then he stood up to his father and Aldo began to see Maurizio in a completely different light. Maybe he could be a leader after all. So he flew from his office in New York to Italy to talk to Rodolfo in person. He told his brother, we are getting older. Maurizio is your only son. He's your true fortune. At first, Rodolfo made a sour face and swatted at the air. He did not want to hear it. But Aldo persisted. It's time to stop being a fool. This isn't just a plea from his brother. It's an order from his boss. So after two years of not speaking, Rodolfo and Maurizio reconcile. He welcomes his son back into the family and tells him to pack his bags because he's heading to New York. When Maurizio comes home excited to share the news, Patrizia just smiles and acts surprised as though she never saw this coming. This is brand new information. (laughs) Exactly. But inside, she's high-fiving herself. She did it. They're back on the game board. Now she needs to consider her next move. Maurizio's truly a Gucci again, but that's not enough. It's time to prove he's the heir apparent. This is episode one of our three-part series, Murder in the House of Gucci. We use many sources when researching our stories, including Vanity Fair, The Guardian, and The House of Gucci by Sarah Gay Forden. I'm Brooke Sifrin. And I'm Arisha Skidmore-Williams. Jojo Wright wrote this episode. Our editor is Allison Reimer. Our audio engineer is Sergio Enriquez. And sound design by James Morgan. Kate Young is our associate producer. Our senior producers are Natalie Shisha and Ben Gray. Our executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Marsha Louie. For Wondery.